let's talk about the New York Times, the paper of record. Lead political reporter who covers Donald Trump, Maggie Haberman, is referred to by Donald Trump as his psychiatrist. So put her aside from a set for a second in that in that relationship. Donald Trump lied as a matter of fact on the record, according to a number of different journalistic organizations, somewhere north, give or take a hundred, thirty-five thousand times. Thirty-five thousand times. Right. So is there any person in the Trump White House who could be trusted under a veil of anonymity to be truthful, who worked for Donald Trump's political operation with the American people in a New York Times story? Meaning, if if you're granting anonymity to the principal agents of Donald Trump, people like Kellyanne Conway or Jared right. Kushner or Ivanka Trump's chief of staff to pursue, pursue their various rivalries and to position, and this has all been talked about, their faction ahead of the other, doesn't that make information a type of currency in a billion-dollar industry? Well... Uh, I take your point and I agree to some extent. I think that you can gather if you're if you're an, a reporter who's covering the White House, you have to have people talking to you. I mean, you have to. That's your job. I think the question is, how much context do you bring? How much uh, other reporting do you bring? How much do you allow sources you know to be parroting? false stuff are you going to put their quotes in a headline and in a tweet and amplify them and give them a megaphone or are you going to kind of do that thing that we call a truth sandwich which is report the truth let them say their falsehoods debunk the falsehood you know that actually has a public service um result and so and you know access journalism is a real thing not everybody is an investigative reporter. Some some reporters, I mean, some reporters have to talk to government sources. It's it's you know you're not going to see an end to that anytime soon. But in to what extent do you bring context? Do you bring the public interest to your reporting and not just allow people to have your platform? My goodness, the platform of the New York Times has to be handled with great great care. Because now it has such incredible sweep, I mean, more than it ever has before, because so many other news organizations have gone out of business. It's it's more powerful than it's ever been. You have a you have a reporter as a matter of journalistic ethics. Who is granting anonymity to political aides in the telling of the daily story about what's happening within the context of an administration that's lying as a matter of course every day, dozens of times a day, hundreds of times a day, the reporter is taking some of these facts, putting them in the paper, keeping some of the facts for use later in a book. Seems like that's an awful lot of latitude for an organization that is steeped according to it in ethics at a moment where trust has collapsed. And I think when people look at this in this totality, they just don't believe in the, in the accumulation of it all, anything that they're told because they see an angle everywhere within a billion dollar industry. And in the end, right, the difference as an ethical proposition, the business between Fox News 
in the New York Times is indistinguishable. Mm, well, I don't really they, agree. With, they I don't, don't agree. I don't agree with trust. that. They have a they have an obligation to return value to their shareholders. Yeah, and, I mean, and their know, business these, partners. These news organizations are they're in a weird position, and it's too bad we don't have media funded a different way, but we don't. So they're corp they're owned by corporations. They are, yes, they are answerable through channels to their shareholders. And they're also a public trust. And so those things are hard to square many times. And then you've also got like other factors. You've got the fact that a reporter would also like to write a book and get a million dollar advance. That would be very nice for that reporter, right? And um, and I'm not, you know, you know, I'm not saying reporters can't write books because I don't I don't think I would make that rule if I were the publisher of the New York Times or the editor of the New York Times. Or not, the what I, not, not what I'm saying. I think I think there's a lot of reporters that have written great books. I'm talking about transparency. Yeah. New York Times says. This is the paper of record. It's what the New York Times says about itself. And the person we've chosen to make our lead political correspondent, who the president who's lied 35,000 times calls his psychiatrist, who writes a book, keeps information in that book that was newsworthy in the day, because there's an assessment of, well, there's an inherent value to this piece of information. Um, you know, a dollar here. 25 cents. This will go in the book. This will go in the paper. This will go in the blog. I'll save this for the cable contract. My, my point is, if the publicly stated goal, mission of the organization is to print all the news that's fit to print, that model is not printing all the news that's fit to print. That model guarantees a lot of printing at, of news that's unfit to print. A, right, and B, um, withholds a lot of news that is that is fit to print. Um, well, you know, I'm not generally in the in the camp of defending the New York Times, but I feel an obligation to say that reporters who are in that position in which they're writing a book and also filing daily stories are conferring with their editors about you know, here's what I've got. I, you know, do you want this as a daily story or not? And, you know, I mean, I'm not in those meetings. I don't know. It may well be that those are reasonable decisions. Um, I can tell you that when I wrote my most recent book, which had a lot about the Washington Post in it, I took issue with Bob Woodward, of all people, who held back um, because Absolutely. of his uh, because of his book, he held back information uh, about Trump's view of COVID that, that Trump knew very well from the beginning that COVID was going to be disastrous and killer and all of that. And Woodward decided to hold that back. So and this so is not this is not this is not just about Trump. It's not just about The New York Times. And so and so to that point, because I think this is a dominant feature of our time. Bob Woodward holds it back. Joe Scarborough goes on MSNBC and he says, every single Democrat that you see appear on this show, 100% of them says one thing on camera and another thing off camera. Every one of them with regard to the president's stamina. John Kelly, the chief of staff, finally told us what he thought about Trump. Dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of people saw over many, many years the behaviors that were not printed, that were not reported, where the behavior was normalized. And as you've pointed out in your writing on any given day, absurdly, well, he read a teleprompter competently. He's about to be presidential. Right. Right. And in the in the accumulation of the totality of it all, there's the total collapse of trust in reality. Yeah. You know, at the at the at the end of the day. 
Yeah. I think one of my chief criticisms of the media in this moment is what is happening in the country is covered like a reality show, episodically. Mm -hmm. There's no causality uh, between what's occurring today on Wednesday and what happened yesterday on Tuesday or last year or last month or 10 years before that. And I think it's important because this moment, in my view, is another day in an unfolding, ongoing news story that is the greatest news story of our time, which is the rise of an extremist, fascistic movement in the United States in seven years' time that threatens America's democracy and peace and prosperity at, at an enormous consequential moment in the world. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you completely. I'm very worried about it. And I do think that the news media, the journalism, if you want to use the subset, smaller subset, has failed to get that across to everyone. It's gotten it across to a lot of people, but there's a third of the country, let's say. I mean, I don't know what the numbers are exactly, but you know what? I think those folks are, you know, they are glued to Fox News or equivalent, and I'm not sure they're reachable. So when we justifiably say that's a bad headline in the New York Times, or why is the Times running, you know, why is this newspaper or this CNN or whatever doing this bad job with a live town hall? Yes, true. But but if they did it incrementally better, is it going to bring those people who are glued to Fox News around? I I would like to think so, but I don't think so. I think they're I think those folks are lost to us, and it, and it's a real shame. And I don't know what to do about it. Thank you for watching. Make sure you subscribe to our channel so you never miss a video. Also, for more content just like this, please consider joining our Warning Premium community. You can find out more in the description below.